So we're going to try to get you all going with, with your environments. Uh, so I know there were a lot of you that were not, uh, did not RSVP. Um, so we're going to work through the, the list of all the people and uh, make sure that everyone has a, has a hands-on environment. Um, so if you, if you have any problem, anyone that is wearing the, the purple plum grid polo can help you with getting the environment set up and uh, logging into the lab. Um, so first of all, I wanted to thank you for, for joining us today for this lab. Um, I'm happy to see so many people interested in learning about OpenStack networking, so that's great. And uh, we hope that we can get you going with uh, a good understanding of the functionality of Neutron, how to configure networks, security policies, and all these sort of uh, things that are important for any multi-tenant environment. Um, so just before we get started, a little bit about myself, and then we'll have another speaker that is now in the back that is trying to help everyone get started with the labs. Um, so my name is Valentina Lari. I'm part, I've been part of the OpenStack community for, for a very long time. Uh, my very first summit was in Santa Clara at this point six years back. Um, and uh, I do all sort of things, helping customers learn about OpenStack networking and uh, SDN and um, related technologies. And I've been doing that for, for a number of years. And uh, I have with me Jamal. Um, his part of our system, system engineering, customer engineering group, and he does a lot of work with, again, with customers um, on the technical side. So um, we are part of the team that um, here is here with PlumGrid. And uh, what today is absolutely not about PlumGrid, um, you're going to see that kind of the backend technology that we're going to use for this lab, it's based on, on what we do. And uh, we are an SDN solution that has a Neutron plugin. So it's just kind of one of the various options that you have when you go and deploy OpenStack networking. So I'll walk you through just uh, 10, 15 minutes, not even 10 minutes, I'll try to do it super quick, uh, so that everyone is on the same page in terms of terminology, concepts, uh, what we're doing here, and whenever we refer to you know, specific um, uh, term, terms, uh, you, you're all familiar with what we're talking about. And then we're going to jump into uh, just real quick on the PlumGrid plugin, which is what you're going to be using today as the backend for OpenStack networking. And then we'll go into the hands-on lab. Um, just a quick uh, raise of hands of how many of you um, are already familiar with OpenStack networking, have done any type of configuration? Kind of half. OK, so we'll try to squeeze in some more advanced stuff. This is a kind of a beginner lab, uh, so I also want to be mindful of the other people that are kind of brand new. Uh, but we'll try to you know, put in a few, um, as much as we can in terms of more advanced information there. All right, so, uh, so real quick on OpenStack networking. Um, so obviously, this is what we're going to be doing our hands-on lab today. And uh, the main goal for, for OpenStack networking was to provide OpenStack, to provide networks within OpenStack as a service. So the same level of on-demand configurability of networking that you have for compute and storage this was really the goal of OpenStack uh, networking. It wasn't introduced from the very beginning. Uh, it was just introduced with a Folsom release. And uh, the, the goal was to expose this uh, on-demand creation of networks, both to the cloud operator as well as to the tenants. So you'll see today, as we go through the lab, you're going to be logging in and creating things as an admin. Uh, and those are the more advanced functionalities, like external connectivity, uh, for example, which is where you start mapping virtual and physical constructs together. And you're also going to be doing things as a tenant. So you have your, uh, your tenant environments that you can go and create your own networks, your own routing, your own security policies, and all sort of things that are needed for your own application in there. Uh, so what you see today is that when you interact with OpenStack, you're going to interact through the OpenStack dashboard as well as through the OpenStack um, API. Um, what you're going to go is that you're going to hit the Neutron server. And Neutron is really a thin layer there. And uh, those API are then going to go to the Neutron plugin that you're leveraging. In this specific lab, you're going to be using the PlumGrid plugin as a, as a networking component. So what will happen there is that the API call will be sent from the OpenStack layer all the way to the backend component. And the backend component will be the one that will be, in practice, responsible for actually creating all the networking functionality that you're demanding through the API layer. Now, the actual implementation of this networking functionality obviously greatly varies depending on which backend you're, you're leveraging there. Um, so in the specific case of PlumGrid, we are an SDN solution. We use overlay technologies. So what we do is that we 
um, give you the ability to create kind of any type of network functionality because the overlay layer decouples your tenant environment from the physical underlying infrastructure. So you have a lot of flexibility. Uh, if you're using an environment that it's a little more traditional, where you're actually mapping to VLANs and physical switches, you have a little more constraints in terms of what you can do for your tenant environments. Okay? Um, so what can users do with Neutron? Um, there is a few basic operations that you'll be able to ex you know, explore today. Uh, the main thing is that you're going to be able to create networks. Um, the assumption is that each project, each tenant environment, it's its own isolated bubble. So you'll be able to create um, any IP address that you want to use in there. You all have a hands-on guide. Um, if you don't, we'll get to, we'll get to you. Uh, but the hands-on guide will guide you through that and will suggest some IP addresses. But it's your own private environment. You can do anything you want in there. Um, so if you want to use 10, 10, 10, 20, 20, 20, whatever you want, it's your own private bubble. That's the beauty of this model. You're then going to be able to connect, obviously, workloads to each network. And then you're going to be able to start interconnecting networks together with routers. Um, so this is obviously what we're going to go through today. And then the next step, which is very interesting, is the step of providing what we call external connectivity from the tenant environment to, again, kind of external networks. The idea there is that you start leaving your virtual environment and you start going into your physical legacy infrastructure. So you'll see that this step is when you actually uh, log in as an admin and you perform some operations as an admin. You're going to start um, you know, looking at, OK, how am I going to get out of this virtual environment? Which physical interface am I going to map to? Which real IP address I'm going to use to leave my tenant environment and go into the physical world? And then this functionality, known as external networks, is that exposed to the tenants that can then consume it inside their bubble, inside their tenant environment. All right? Uh, so you'll see that we'll keep referring to tenant networks, which are the networks that uh, any tenant can create as part of their project. And then we'll refer to the concept of provider networks. Now, provider networks are a very interesting and complex topic. Uh, there are three types of provider networks in OpenStack. And that's where it gets real fun. Uh, so networks can be external, can be non-external, or can be shared. Today, we're going to do the very simple one, which is the external network. Uh, the idea of the other types of networks is that they're going to give you a different type of connectivity between the tenant environment and the external world, and in between tenants as well. Um, if you have more questions on the different type of external networks, we can certainly review some of those as well. Jamal can uh, certainly jump into some of that too. Now, anytime you have an external network or a provider network, you have a question? OK. Um, anytime you, um, sorry, what was I saying? Anytime you connect the tenant environment with the external network, you'll see that there's actually an implicit NAT function that gets established. The reason for that is obviously that you have your private IP space within the tenant environment, and you're now mapping into the legacy world, right? And so when you go from your private IP space to the public IP space, you're going to use a NAT function to translate IPs from one side to the other. So source NAT, it's enabled by default as you exit uh, your project. And also, you can enable floating IPs so that you can actually connect from the outside world into your private environment. So you can have a, uh, a client sitting out there that wants to connect to a server that it's a VM within your private project. That can be done through the concept of floating IP. So all of that comes into the picture when you enable a provider network external connectivity type of functionality. OK, so uh, anytime you deploy OpenStack, you're always going to select a plugin. For this exercise, we're going to use the PlumGrid plugin. If you go to the OpenStack marketplace and look for the drivers, you're going to see a very long list of networking plugins and networking options. Those are all tested for Neutron. So when you deploy OpenStack, you can select any of those uh, for the sake of you know, your deployment. Um, as I said, PlumGrid is an overlay-based uh, solution. So what we're going to see is that we're going to have a software component that is deployed inside each server. Uh, in our case, we, we use a component that is called an IOVisor. It's a kernel-based component. Again, don't worry about it today. Just remember that there's a software piece that runs inside each compute node. It will actually implement the networking functions that you define through the API layer on top. And then there is an overlay solution. What it means is that there are tunnels, VXLAN tunnels, that get established between compute node and compute node. 
to allow you to have this virtual environment decoupled from the physical infrastructure underneath. Uh, now, in the, in the environment that you have in the hands-on guide, there is a lot more components of what we're going to cover today. There's a lot of plant grid specific monitoring, visualization things that you can explore in, on your own if you're interested in. You're going to have those environments for a while, for a few hours, so you can certainly go and do that. We're not going to cover any of the plant grid specific stuff in here. Um, so I think we can quickly just look at this. Uh, you're going to bounce back and forth between OpenStack and the backend just to get a feel for how things get translated from one side to the other. This is the same for any plugin that you have. You're always going to see a translation from the OpenStack abstractions to whatever backend implementation you're using there. Um, so just to, you know, these slides give you an idea of when you create an OpenStack project, this translates to a concept of what we call a virtual domain, which is this tenant environment on PlumGrid side. And we represent the concept of switches and routers and NAT as little network functions. Those are the icons that you'll see on the PlumGrid side. So this just helps you kind of you know, get a context for, for what you're going to see during the, during the lab. Uh, so during the hands-on lab, we are going to um, all log into an environment. Again, if you don't have it yet, don't pa no panic. We're going to get you one. And uh, Jamal is anyway going to walk you through the steps so you can follow along, and we can get to the environment, worst case, at the, at the end. Um, so you all should have an email, or we gave you the IP address uh, manually. You need a VNC client to access your environment. Uh, if you have a Mac, you can just log into your Safari window browser, and it's, um, you can just you know, do a screen sharing from there. Otherwise, you can download a uh, VNC client. Um, you have an IP address. Uh, the port is 10.0.0.5, and the password is PlumGrid. Uh, so all of you should be able to, to log in. And if not, raise your hand, and we will we'll come help you there. And uh, we're going to do uh, four major things today. We're first going to log in, and we're going to start creating uh, projects in OpenStack as an admin. And then we're going to log back in as a tenant, and we're going to start creating our own networks in that environment. We're going to start creating you know, layer two networks, interconnect them with routers. Um, we're also going to enable external connectivity for those networks. And last but not least, we're going to start creating security groups so that we can enforce policies between VMs. You'll see it's a very powerful construct in OpenStack. We're gonna, gonna, not going to get into the monitoring troubleshooting, because a lot of the monitoring and troubleshooting is actually specific to the backend. Um, so again, if you're interested in, the, in learning more about that, which is more specific to the PlumGrid solution, in the hands-on guide, you have three extra exercises that you can go through that are more on the troubleshooting side. Um, and uh, the last thing I want to mention is that if you're interested, we have a certification that PlumGrid is running that it's around OpenStack networking. Um, obviously, the OpenStack Foundation has a certification that's broader around the whole OpenStack. But we've been working very closely with the user community for a number of years, and we have developed a certification that is specific for anyone that wants to learn about OpenStack networking. Um, so you're definitely welcome to check that one out if you want to you know, learn more about it. All right, so let's jump into the hands-on lab. And I'm going to go down and help people. So you have the VNC? Yep. So let's, uh, let's start with the exercise. Uh, most of you have already got the email with the IP address and the port. So uh, you just fill in the IP address with the 10.0.0.0.5 port and uh, connect, to the, uh, connect to your uh, instance. The password is PlumGrid. I'm actually going to close all the uh, sessions over here so that I can start from the start. So on the instance, uh, you just log in into the Chrome browser. And once you log into the Chrome browser, automatically we have three uh, windows already open. One is the PlumGrid console. Uh, the second would be the Horizon dashboard. And the third is the PlumGrid Cloud Apex. Uh, we're not going to use go through the PlumGrid Cloud Apex today in the exercise. It's pretty much going to be everything driven from uh, the Horizon dashboard. And we can switch back and forth between the Horizon dashboard and the BG console, uh, the PlumGit console, just to see that how uh, backend implementation is done uh, when you 
perform some networking options, operations from Horizon Dashboard. So if you have the first exercise already open, uh, let's start with the first exercise. In the first one, we're just creating uh, a tenant and then uh, creating a user, assigning that uh, tenant to or a project to that user, uh, and showing that how uh, a different tenant within the OpenStack is implemented in, back, uh, in the backend implementation as well. So let's uh, log in into the OpenStack Horizon dashboard with the admin workflow. So once you double click on the Google icon, you are going to see three different windows, right? You just have to uh, go through a different, okay, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll have Valentina and the other guys actually help it out. There might be a, uh, so are, are you at the uh, certificate, like the, a, a page when you open up the uh, Chrome browser? All right. Just do a double click, it should, should open. Uh, so for the, for the admin, for the Horizon dashboard? It's admin plum gate for the admin uh, user, yes. And for the plum gate console, it's plum gate plum grid. If you open up the, uh, the guide that, that we sent you side by side, all the information would be in the guide as well regarding the uh, passwords and, and, and so on and so forth. So let's, uh, let's start with the first exercise. In the very first step, what we are doing is that uh, we are creating a new project and uh, seeing that how that project is side-by-side uh, uh, -side implemented in the backend implementation. Uh, so when you create a project, uh, we can name anything I want. If you just do a mylab-1, give the description accordingly, project for lab1. In the project members, you can assign different members to this, uh, to your project. Uh, I'm going to actually create a user afterwards and then assign that user to this uh, project. And in the quota information, you get all the quotas which are by default set to the default values. You create a project, uh, you go to the users tab, create a user. In the username, uh, again, fill in any name, uh, for, for the user that you want to create for your project. Maybe provide the passwords for it. So at the primary project, you assign the project to a particular user. Here I just, I'm just creating a user lab one for the recently created my lab one project that I just created and assign it as a member of that project. So when you create a user and assign to that project, you can log out and log in as a user of your uh, Horizon dashboard, which will only ha have access to that particular tenant. So the first operation is kind of the admin, uh, cloud admin's job, which he, where he goes on and creates the tenants, and the second is the, the user job. Yep. Okay, uh, I'll actually, uh, I think, uh, so Valentina? Can you help uh, this guy over here in the front? All right. Somebody would be here right now to actually help you out, so. So we just log in using the same credentials, user lab one, password was plum grid. So now we have actually logged in into the uh, the first uh, project that we created, mylab-1. From this project, you can just, like, you, you just have the uh, 
authority to actually go through just, just this project and not access the other project. So it's kind of a user uh, driven uh, steps. Similarly, once we, uh, that's fine, yeah. So if you go to the backend implementation on the PlumGrid side, I have a lot of different users which are already created, but you're gonna see that a new tenant has appeared, MyLab1, and if you go to the neutron-based topology that is currently running, since we have not created anything, uh, no networks, no instances, nothing, it's going to show you an empty uh, canvas where there is no topology currently running. But it shows you that a, a separate tenant, uh, a different tenant has, has been created in the backend implementation as well. So going back, that's uh, pretty much the first exercise in which we are just creating, we just created a project, uh, created a user, uh, assigned the user to that project, and, and then sign off and log in back again uh, as a user of uh, OpenStack Lab. So let's uh, move on to the next exercise. Uh, in the next exercise, what we are going to do is that uh, go, through an ex go through an exercise where we create networks, uh, create, a, for example, a three-tiered application networks where you have three different networks connected to a router, uh, and uh, create instances for each network, and then just provide connectivity and show that if you have connectivity across your different networks, different subnets. And, and back and forth, I'll keep on going back and forth from uh, the backend implementation on the PromGrid side, on the PromGrid console, how the backend implementation is done, and how the similar kind of implementation is shown on the OpenStack uh, side on the Horizon dashboard in the, on the network topology. Uh, yeah, let me, let me actually, so right now we are on page 17 on the guide, exercise two. So on the first page 17 and page 18, uh, you'll notice that uh, the end goal, like how many different networks and what's the end goal in both uh, from the network topology side, what are we trying to drive in this exercise? So we log in into the first project, that's the, we, I'm already logged in into the MyLab1 uh, project over here. And I'm gonna walk uh, through creating um, three different networks, for example, a three-tier application where you have a web network, an app network, and a DB network, and then creating instances uh, accordingly. So let's go on to the network tab and uh, create a network in this, uh, in this project. You do a create network. You can provide any uh, arbitrary name for your network. So let's do user one dash web. In this, you can define the subnet name. So it's going to be web uh, network and define, it's, it's going to be a private IP network space. So you are pretty much open to uh, use any IP network space that you want to use for this network. So just for the sake that we, we use the same networks as defined in the lab, we can go ahead and use that. <coughs> so one, two, six, eight, uh, 50 dot zero slash 24, and then we provide the gateway IP as well. If you don't provide the gateway IP over here, it's just going to take the default one, but uh, let's go ahead and provide the first IP as the gateway IP for this network. Uh, by default, this network has a DHCP, VN, uh, a DHCP function enabled as part of uh, the network itself, and you can define different allocation pools uh, as, uh, on its uh, DHCP, uh, on the DHCP, and accordingly the DNS name servers as well. And if you want to inject some host routes for your VMs for via DHCP, you can do that from the Horizon dashboard as well. So once we uh, click create, it creates a network uh, within the first tenant, my lab one. Uh, if you go to the network topology within this uh, tenant, you see that there is a network that we created, user1-web, with the same subnet already created. The blue line, it's an external network, and we'll, we'll, we are gonna get to it 
in exercise four where we can go over more that what different kind of external networks that we can create. But that's more related to the provider networks that Valentina was discussing earlier. So you have created a orange line, uh, an orange color subnet over here. The same kind of implementation uh, via backend, if you wanna switch over to the PlumGet console, you'll see that it's, uh, it has a network that's created with the same name. User one dash web with a DHCP uh, uh, enabled uh, on it as well. So going back, let's create uh, two more networks, uh, one for the app layer and then another for the DB layer. Let's do user one dash app. So similarly we can uh, use any other uh, IP address that we have already not assigned to the other uh, network that we just created within this tenant. So it's 192.168, let's do 40.0 slash 24 and provide the gateway IP as well. Again, the DHCP is enabled by default. So just do a create, it creates another network and create the third one as well, that's user one dash DB, dash DB network and uh, provide the gateway IP for this network. So in this manner we have created three separate subnets, three separate networks uh, within your project one, within the first tenant that we just created. And if you switch on to the, switch over to the network topology view within Horizon dashboard, you see that three separate tenants which are not connected, which are isolated among uh, each other, are separately created uh, for each, uh, for each different tenant that you, have, for each different network that you just created. So from the exercise, I think we have gone on to page 26 now. So we have actually created three different networks Huh? Just pause for a second. Sure. All right, so most of you should have it. We're gonna get you guys all the environments uh, that you're missing. So just to kind of summarize, so everyone that was on the wait list. Uh, so first of all, the port for the BNC is 10.0.0.5. The password is PlumGrid. And then the logins for the PlumGrid console, it's PlumGrid, PlumGrid. The OpenStack one is admin. Admin PlumGrid. Admin PlumGrid, okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, if you want the hands-on guide, I put it on a teeny URL, URL so if you guys wanna, um, do you wanna just open a, uh, do you want? just open, I just wanna put, so it's tiny URL, URL slash G T A E J H K. G T A E J H K, yes. So, tiny URL. Dot com. Oh, okay. okay, so just write down the URL as well, not this one. Okay, so let oh, me... Oh, don't open this. Tiny URL, GTA. Tiny URL. Okay, this one. Just leave it like this. So it's G-T-A-E-J-H-K.
so most of you have already got to the uh, right so anybody who has not yet uh, got to the uh, instance yet yes yeah, so so this is the link so anybody who wants to get the link uh, for the user guide that's the link that has just been uploaded with the user guide so it's tinyurl.com g d a e j h k if you've already uh, signed in you will probably see the same uh, user guide already emailed to you so you can use that from there as well Uh, can you just, uh, I, I couldn't hear you. Can you just come, come again? Mm -hmm. So we are actually creating networks from within the project itself. And that's, that's not an external network. That's not a provider network. We actually are creating an internal networks. So in the exercise, the second exercise that you have, you actually, actually have to log in through the user that you just created. And within the user tab, let me actually go back and show you. So this is the user that I created. And once you go to the user in the network tab, you see networks, and you just do a create network, and that's, that's the only workflow that you, have, you should have. Are you logged in as an admin user? As an admin? So, when, so once you actually select as an admin, you actually get the admin uh, uh, role. And from the admin role, you can actually, so I'll actually, uh, uh, you can actually s create the external networks as well. But right now for this exercise, we are just creating the internal networks and not the external uh, provider networks. So that's the exercise that's going to be exercise four, which we are going to get to it later on. On the guide, if you have a guide, we are following, uh, we are right now on page 26. So we started the page 17, the exercise two, and right, right now on page 26. So uh, let me just go back. It's tinyurl.com, this one. Yep, so tiny, tiny URL. Oh, okay, let me actually, okay. So for the user guide, you can access the user guide from the, from the link that is provided right now. So have most of you already joined in uh, and have access to the user guide, I can actually recap the first two exercises quickly as well. All right. Okay. So <clears throat> so the, in the first exercise, let's actually log out and sign back again. So you sign in into the OpenStack dashboard using the credentials admin plum grid. I'll actually, oh.
and you can sign in into the uh, yes. you can again sign back into the uh, PlumGrid console using the username as PlumGrid and password PlumGrid as well. So let's let's just quickly go over the first uh, two exercises what we did earlier. So when you sign into the admin uh, admi as an admin uh, of your resin dashboard, you can go on and create uh, projects to uh, to create for uh, to create tenants and projects within your uh, horizon from within your OpenStack deployment. So we go to the projects tab from your admin tab, and you can do a create project. Within that create project, just came just give any name that you uh, that you want for your project. So. If you open up this, uh, there are like within the guide that we have over here at this link, all these steps have snapshots as well side by side, so you can open them, them open them up side by side, and just you know walk through them. So you do a create project, uh, add any name. Let's do um, lab test dash one. Within the project members, uh, you can leave it as, as it is and just go on to the create the project. And later on when you create the user, you can assign that user to the project that you just created. So go to the user tab, uh, click the create user, uh, add in any name. My lab test one. Given the passwords, and s from the primary project tab, you can actually scroll uh, down to the project that you just created for yourself. So it's my lab test one, and assign the role for this. You can just assign the role as member for uh, for the user that you're creating. Once you create the user and assign it to a particular project, you can log out from your uh, admin dashboard and log in into the op OpenStack Horizon dashboard as a user of it. So you can do my lab test one with a password. And in this way, you are actually into a new newer tenant. Uh, again, uh, we just, which you just created. If you check from the OpenStack Horizon dashboard and go to the network topology, it's completely empty except the external network, which is the provider network, which has already been created from the admin workflow. Just to save time, we have already created that. But uh, from the tenant topology itself, there is completely empty. Similarly, if you see the backend implementation from Plumgrid console, that how this uh, network is, this this new ten this new project that you created, is it is it created in the back end as well? So you have my lab test one and you have the test lab over here as well. So this is the first exercise, just creating the project, creating a user and uh, assigning that uh, user to that project a role and then logging into the OpenStack Horizon dashboard with, with the user credential that you just created. So in the same tenant, let's go on to the page 17 of your uh, user guide and create the next few uh, networks. Within, within the exercise two, you're going to create multiple different networks. In, for this exercise, we are using, uh, we are trying to create a three-tier to network topology where you have three different networks and are connected with each other via router. So let's create uh, three different networks within that, uh, within that tenant. Go to the network tab. Within the network tab, to networks. Do a create network over here. And here you can again name anything. So let's do user one dash web. Assign the subnet name. Provide any private IP space that you want to do. So we can do 192.168.50.0. I'm just following exactly the same uh, uh, 
address schemes as you have in the in the guide as well. So you have 192.168.50.0 as slash 24. And on the gateway IP, you provide the gateway IP. If you don't provide the gateway IP, again, it's going to choose a default one uh, by itself. By default, the DHCP uh, network function is already enabled when you create a network uh, or a subnet in your, uh, in your project. Just do a create. So that actually uh, leaves you to create one subnet uh, within your project that you just created. If you just scroll down to the network topology tab, you'll see that you have one network that is created completely isolated from all the other networks that you have, uh, and that's, that's the topology that you have right now. If you do the same thing on the backend ones and within your network, which was uh, that how uh, the backend is implemented, so you have a network which is already created, same name, and uh, with the DHCP VNFS, we have uh, enabled the DHCP as well. So let's go to the networks tab and uh, create two more networks just to complete the exercise. So we have user two dash app. The subnet name is anything else again. You can choose arbitrary IP address schemes. Let's do 40.0 slash 24. Just want to confirm what was, okay, just 50.0. Let's do 40 this one. Use a one dot dash app. Add in the subnet name. Let's do one nine two one six eight forty dot zero slash twenty four. Do a gateway IP. And this way we have created the second network. Let's go and create the third network as well. So user one dash db to a subnet name as db192.168.30.0 slash 24, 192.168.30.1. And just do a create. So that actually allows you to create three different networks. And uh, you can see the same in the network topology. So you have three isolated networks created within the MyLab test one project that you just created. On the back end, if you want to see the back end implementation, switch on to the uh, Plumgate console. Uh, you can rearrange your topology over here as well. So you have three separate networks which are created at the back end. Each has DHCP enabled, but each uh, are totally separate right now as there is no router in between them to, uh, to route in the router traffic in between them. So let's go on and uh, so that actually is page 26 of our exercise. So let us know if you have any questions. Uh, we can slow down or like uh, fasten the pace as well. So moving on, we create a router and then create the router interfaces for all the three networks that we just created. So we go onto the router tab within the network uh, options and click on the create router tab. We can provide an, uh, any router name. So you have user one dash router. And similarly, if you check on the console, you have a user one the router that is created. Right now, this user one router is not connected to any of the networks that you created, so you have to attach the interface of this router to each of the three networks that you just created earlier. So you have, you enter into the user one router config and uh, go to the interfaces tab and click on the add interfaces. So you have, and there you, and within the add interface tab, you can pretty much select all the different networks that are part of your current project. 
So you are in the MyLab test one project, it will only show you uh, the three networks that you just created. We can also provide the IP address, but since we already have provided the gateway IP when, when we were creating the network, so the same IP is going to be taken by, this, uh, by, uh, by the router as well. So we have, so this way we have created one interface with the DB network that we have, and similarly we create two more interfaces with one with the app, one with the web, interf web subnet, and the third one with the application app, app subnet. So you see on the, on, within the interfaces tab on the Horizon dashboard you have three different uh, interfaces, part of the, part of the router. So you, and each has got the same IP that you provided as a default gateway for your network when creating a network. So you go to the network topology tab and see that if you have uh, if you can see uh, the same thing in the network topology. So you have a router which is showing that it has three interfaces which are active with one of the networks as 192.168.50.1, and 30.1, and similarly the names are mentioned over here as well. If we can see the same thing, how it is implemented in the backend, we can go onto the PlumGit console and see that there, are, there is a router in between the three networks that you have just created, and it's connected to each of the three networks. So this is, uh, so as a last step within this exercise, you're going to create two VMs, or in fact, uh, VMs in each of the three networks that you created and just see that whether you can have traffic connectivity between these three VMs. So moving forward, uh, let's go on and go to the compute part of uh, compute tab within the project one, go to the instances, and launch an instance, which will then allow you to actually pick uh, the different security groups and different uh, networks which you have already created. So let's name this as Web VM. You can select the different flavors as well. So right now we are just bringing up, uh, since it's just a single instance, we are just bringing up a very minor, tiny flavor of CROS already configured. Within the network, uh, I've named this as a web VM, so let's pick the web uh, network as the VM is connected to. So you have user one web as your uh, interface with which the VM would connect to. You do a launch and the VM gets uh, created within that particular network. Once it's active, it goes through a process of uh, spawning and then once it's active, you'll see that the IP address that it got from the DHCP that was enabled on this network, so it's the same network and uh, since we never uh, gave any pool for the DHCP, it's pretty much the whole slash 24 as a pool for the, for the DHCP. We can see the same thing on the network topology. So if you go on the network topology, you uh, check the VM. Okay, it's up right now, and it's connected right now to user web when, uh, user one web. So let's go on and create two more instances. We go again to the large instance. This time we are creating a DB VM. We select a uh, the same image that is available. And we select the DB network over here. This time the network, uh, the, the DB VM should come up with uh, the DB network, and you can see that the IP address that this DB VM is getting is from the same network uh, pool that you have uh, for the database for the DB uh, network that you created. So you can go back again to the network topology just to see that the VM is up, if it's connected to the current cor correct uh, network. So you have a DB VM which is connected to a DB network within the network topology. 
if you if you navigate to the networks tab, you can see the same ports within the networks as well. So if you go to the, we had just created a VM which is part of the DB network. You enter into the DB network details and you see that there are two interfaces, two ports which are created as part of the uh, DB subnet. So you have one as the interface with the router. It shows a router interface and the other is the uh, compute Nova for the Nova instance that you just created. Going back, let's create another instance. So the third one is app VM. And in this one, we, will, we are going to use the third subnet that we created. So that's user one app. Let's create a VM over here. So this time when the VM comes up as an active state, you'll see that uh, the IP address it's getting is from, uh, from that subnet. So we have three VMs which are right now connected to three different subnets. And then each of these subnets is connect, has an interface with a router so that the traffic uh, can be routed in between the three networks. So let's log in into any one of the VMs and see that if, if we can ping any of the other VMs from that VM. So we, in fact, just let me go back. So if you just click on any of the VMs, you go into the VM details. On the console tab, uh, you, can in, you can directly go to the console of this VM. So just do a only console over here. It's a Ceros VM, so it's, uh, the admin is Ceros and Password is win. So once you enter, let's just confirm that if we have the same IP uh, over here as we are showing in the, so it's 40.3. Let me go back to the instance details, to the Horizon dashboard. So on the Horizon dashboard, we had the similar IP for the app VM as 40.3. So the app VM internally has the same IP as well as, it, as it's shown in the in the Horizon dashboard. So let's go back again to the instance and try to connect to any of the two other two VMs. So we can ping, uh, we can send a ping traffic for 30.3 or 50.3 and it should work because from the network topology, you can see that there is a router in between the three networks. So the VM from each of the networks should be able to ping uh, other VMs. So just to ping 192.168.50.3, that works. And similarly, let's try the other one, which was 30.3. This works as well. So this, uh, so this actually completes the exercise too, where just to recap, you created three separate networks, then you created a router in between these networks. Uh, attach the interface of this router to each of these network that you created, and then spawn VMs within each of this network, and then try and just to tr and then try to uh, pass uh, traffic across it. So as the net the router is directly connected to each of the networks, you you are uh, you have the traffic uh, you have the traffic connectivity across uh, across the networks. So that ends uh, our uh, second exercise. And now we are actually on the page 35, by, th by the end of page 35. And from, from page 36, we can start off the exercise three. Right, so moving on, uh, I'm actually going through the exercises so that uh, we can complete the three, four, and five exercises within by the time limit that we have. And uh, you have the leverage to actually, you know, uh, check other instances, check uh, what else that you can do with the instance itself. 
So let's moving on. Uh, let's go with the exercise three. Uh, within exercise three, what we are going to try to do is trying to figure out that how these tenants or different projects that you created are completely isolated from each other. So they are completely separate, dif different networks. So, yeah. So I'm, yeah, let's pause. Okay, so let's just recap a little bit of what we've done so far, since we've been doing a lot of different things, and I know some people were um, kind, of, kind of trying to catch up with the overall thing. So, um, so what we did in this environment, we created a bunch of projects, right? So each of these projects is a tenant. And for each of these projects, we started creating some of these networks. So you saw that as you started creating networks, you started getting these virtual, you know, these uh, vertical lines show here. So those are your layer two environments. And uh, for each of those, you specified a specific IP range, right? And as you started creating VMs and attaching VMs to these networks, you started seeing that the VMs were getting IP addresses that belong to that subnet that we had there. Um, so for whatever, you know, you, you selected if you follow the guide, you selected dot thirty, dot forty, and dot fifty, and that's the IP address that the VMs got in that environment. Uh, you can see that the dot one is your default gateway, so that's that got assigned to the router interface, and then the dot three is the interface that got assigned to the VM itself. Okay, so these are your layer two subnets, and then what we did as the next step is that we went back to the network and we started creating routers, right? So. The concept of router, it's obviously a layer, layer three construct, and it's what we'll, we will use to interconnect the different subnets within a tenant environment. Now, um, I know some of you were asking me, where is this router living? How is it implemented? Uh, so the answer for that is that it depends. And the implementation of the router depends heavily on the backend that you're leveraging. So the router could reside on a central component, what is usually referred to as a network node, and that is, um, kind of a server that is dedicated to advanced functions. So that can perform layer three functions. So you will kind of send the packets through that element there. In a plum grid environment, it's quite different because we actually have a kernel component, which is the IOVisor I was referring to earlier, that can implement layer two, can implement layer three, can implement layer four, can implement security. It's the one that collects all the uh, statistics that you see in the Cloud Apex window, for example. So when you create a router, you actually don't spin any central element. You just leverage this distributed functionality that we have as part of the IOVisor framework. Okay, so it's just to kind of clarify where things live. In a plum grid environment, everything lives distributed. The beauty of OpenStack is that it doesn't matter. If you're just a consumer of OpenStack as a tenant, all you see is these abstractions, these layer two subnets, these routers, these functionalities that you have here. Okay? Now, once we have created this network topology, you can see that the tenant, the tenant has multiple bunch of networks, the VMs can talk to each other, but what it's missing here is that they actually cannot connect to the outside world. And I know some of you had questions on, okay, how do I connect out, right? So this is where things start becoming interesting because we start seeing the interaction between the tenant world and the provider world, the admin of the cloud. Okay, so we're gonna start now going through the next step, which is how we connect from a tenant environment to the external network. And we're gonna see that actually that step is something that the cloud admin has taken care of for me ahead of time. I have already an external network that is created, which is this blue network. And as a tenant, I can just consume it. Do you have a question? Yep. Uh, you need help? Okay, Deepa. Can Okay, uh, a question, please. So the cloud app, if the cloud apex dashboard, if you cannot get to it, uh, some some instances that are having open is the same IP address and the same port, slash cloud apex with a capital A, if you want to play with that. So we'll take a look at the environment if it is not showing. Okay. Yes. Yes. So, the 
question is, when I launch a VM and I connect it through a network, is that going through OBS? And the answer is not, because in this specific lab that you're working on, there is no OpenV switch. OpenV switch is one of the plugin options that you have. And in this lab, you're not using OpenV switch. You're using a different backend. So if there was OpenV switch in the picture, the layer two functionality would be provided by OpenV switch, and the layer three functionality would be either um, implemented as an agent or through the network node. Here, because you're using PlumGrid, the layer two and the layer three functionality are implemented by PlumGrid inside the kernel. Okay, so it's one of the other backend, depending on what you select at the beginning of time. Any other general questions? So the default user, it's all the PlumGrid stuff. It's PlumGrid, PlumGrid, and the OpenStack one, it's admin PlumGrid. Yeah, the console is PlumGrid, PlumGrid, and Cloud Apex is PlumGrid, PlumGrid. Yes. 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 So the the when you see project, usually projects will show up. Uh, on the PlumGrid side when the two databases sync. And the, sometimes the trigger is the creation of the first network. So when you create the first subnet, that's when the project will show up on the PlumGrid side. And that's when the VMs will show up and all that. Okay. I'll, I'll come take a look in a sec. Okay, so let's, uh, um, if everyone is following along up until now, uh, what we're going to do next is we're going to go into the external network. So Jamal will come back and, uh, and keep going through the, through the next couple of exercises. So what we're going to do for the next two exercises is first we're going to look at the external network. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to log out as a user and we're going to log back in as an admin. And we're going to take a look at the external network configuration. And then we're going to go back as an admin and connect to the external network. And then the last step that we're going to do as part of this lab is that we're going to configure security policies to further isolate and micro-segment um, workloads within a project. Okay? And we'll keep coming around and helping you guys. So for, uh, for the external networks, we have, uh, we have created an external network already. Uh, we just pre-configured. So within my lab, I have, uh, within my instance over here, I have created a number of different tenants and different projects. So that's why you see all the different tenants, all the different projects, all the different networks created in each of these tenants. And uh, since it's an admin user, you get the view of overall how many different tenants uh, are created. So when you click on the networks tab, you get all the networks created in all the different uh, tenants that you have. So within the external network, uh, you see that one of the networks among there is an external network, which is connected to, which, is, which has a subnet, which is uh, routable from, uh, from the outside. So you have an external subnet with this particular gateway IP from which you can actually, once you can reconnect to this subnet, you can uh, move on or you can actually have the connectivity from your virtual world, from your project, from within your tenant to an uh, external world, to the legacy world. The similar kind of implementation within, uh, for the backend implementation is done through uh, a service, uh, through a, so in, in the backend implementation, we have an external network created as well, which is shown over here. So you can actually log in into your, uh, for this exercise, what we are going to do is to log in into back, back into your project, into your tenant, and then connect your router with the external network and see that how internal VMs can have the traffic connectivity with the outside world. So let's uh, log out from uh, from this admin tenant and log back in as the one of the tests that we uh, projects that we created. So it was user lab test or test lab. Ah. 
let me just confirm what are the credentials for my user. So I have my lab test one. So I log in, lo log in back into the project by the same user credentials that I created for the lab test for the for the project. So you have lab test one. Here we have so you get the overview, the summary that you have three instances which are connected to three different networks that you created. So just go over the network topology. So you have three different uh, networks, bridge devices, and that are connected to a router. And now the router is not connected anywhere on the external network, so you cannot connect outside with the, with the external world right now. So let's go to the routers and do a set gateway operation, which then allows you to pick whichever external networks that you have already created and connect your router with the external network. So we have just created one external network that we just saw from the admin uh, from the admin workflow. So you actually log in as an admin and see what are the different external networks that you have. And from here you can choose whichever external networks are allowed to you from the admin workflow. So we have created one external network and we are going to do a set gateway operation for, for, for the external network that you have just created. So we choose set network, select network as external, and click on the set gateway. So what it does is that it creates an interface between the router and the external network. So now, now if you check the network topology, you see that the router, the tenant router, the virtual router within that tenant is right now connected with the uh, external network that you have created from the admin workflow. So all the VMs, so all the different three, all these three networks now are connected to the same router and should have connectivity outside as well. So we can now actually go into the VMs and see if they have connectivity, for example, if they can ping Google. So let's do ping .8, and you should see that it's connected with the outside world. So let us know if you have any questions. We we can, uh, yeah. All right. Yep. Okay. Okay. So every time you create an external network, um, you can take a look at, I think on the PlumGrid side, it's a lot clearer what happens there. Um, so what happened here is that, as you can see, a NAT VNF got created. So every time you connect a tenant environment to an external network, a NAT function gets implemented in the backend. Um, now, this is again a question of where it gets implemented and all of that, but forget that part. Uh, whenever you create a NAT function, the moment you enable external connectivity, S NAT gets enabled on that NAT function. So if you actually go and look at the NAT configuration, you can look at what has been configured there, and you can see that outbound NAT was configured so that you can map your private IP space to the public IP space of the external network. So that's the first step. That's SNAT, Alban NAT. Now, the moment you instead want to get um, someone from the outside to connect to a VM, it's when you define, define floating IP. And that will obviously correspond to inbound NAT. And the way you would do that is you would actually do it from the OpenStack side. You would go to an instance. And what you can do is you can select, for example, your web 
VM and you can associate a floating IP. Okay, so once you associate a floating IP, it's when you will start seeing your inbound NAT configuration getting created. So NAT always, always comes in the picture when you use an external network type of provider API. Okay? Any other question on the external connectivity? So this is certain, it's a, the external network, it's a very uh, tricky point because it's where you have these two worlds, right? The virtual and the physical coming together. So it's usually something that the cloud admin controls, as you saw before, right? The cloud admin was the one that created the environment, you created the external network for you, and you as a tenant are just consuming this as part of your project. All right? Yeah, so let's go to the next, which is the last exercise we're gonna be able to cover today together, which is the security policy function. Uh, so the importance of security policy is obviously that once you create your tenant environment, what you want to be able to do is to farther segment workloads that are part of your project. For example, if you have your web app and web web app and DB tier, you might want to define policies across the three environments, okay? Um, so again, the implementation of these policies can vary depending on the backend, but for, um, from an open stack perspective, it's a very simple abstraction. You just define groups and you start mapping VMs to these groups. So for example, you can define a DB group, a web group, an app group, and you can start defining what type of policies you want to enforce between them. Do you want to let them connect, you want to not let them connect at all, you want to just allow specific protocols or ports to be open. So that is what we do through security policies. So Jamal will walk you through a couple of examples of security policies. And, uh, and then as I said, there's a lot more things that you can do, obviously. Uh, there's um, a lot of API-based configuration that you can do. Everything we did today was UI-driven. Everything that we did can also be done as an API. So we'll see if we have a couple of minutes to show you maybe just a couple of, yeah. of API calls, just to give an idea of what they correspond under the cover. Um, but this is kind of what we wanted to cover today, and you're welcome to continue to work a little more on your instances, um, obviously on the side if you want to go more into the advanced scenarios. So let's right. go yeah. into the security part. So for the last exercise, um, uh, that, that's exercise five. Let me share the page number as well. What, if, what we are actually going to do is to have a scenario where you have similar three-tier kind of application and you wanna have security policy to block some traffic and allow some traffic. So you, for example, if you want to have two different networks and you have web and app, you have web and DB network and you want to connect, have traffic connectivity like ICMP traffic connectivity between DB and web uh, networks, but you want to block uh, SSH traffic from DB to web, but the web uh, connect, can connect uh, via SSH to the DB networks. So let's, let's go on into the process and I can actually then uh, elaborate more on each step that how do you, uh, how do you apply that. So when we created these uh, three VMs earlier, I have, uh, I have created them with the default security group. So what I'm gonna do is that uh, create two more with some different security groups that I'm gonna create right now for, and which, and those security groups will have rules that can actually enable me to, uh, some, to enable me to actually allow the traffic that I want for each network and deny the traffic that, uh, that I want as well. So let's go to the ex uh, access and security. And by default, each, uh, you'll see that each project and each uh, tenant that you created by default gets created with a default uh, security group. It has some default security rules as part of its uh, group. So let's go on and create a new security group which we can call DB and then assign uh, VMs accordingly to it. So let's go on and create a, a security group that is known as let's say security group DB. Security group for DB networks. So as you create a new security group 
from your uh, Horizon dashboard, you see you can actually manage its rules. So if you just go into the manage rules section, you see that there are two rules which are automatically created within, within your security group. Now let's go on and uh, delete these because we want to create rules which specify our, uh, what we want to accomplish over here. So we want to have ICMP traffic being allowed from uh, both web and DB networks but only the web should be able to SSH to the DB and DB should not be able to SSH back into, web, into the web. So let's go on and delete uh, these two rules. And create another rule. So right now, in fact, just, just we'll actually delete all the rules, create the VMs, and then see uh, how step-by-step step we can go. So go back to the access and security create another security group that is for the web VMs. So that's do security group dash web. The security group dash web, let's go on inside and then delete the default security rules that are uh, part of the security group again. So select all, delete the rules. So right now you have created two different security groups. Once one you named as security group DB and then the other one as security group web and deleted the default rules that were part of the security group, right? So let's bring up one VM in each of these uh, groups and then see that whether these VMs can, uh, can uh, have traffic connectivity between them or not. So let's do a web VM that has CROS image. So within the access and security tab, you see that all the security groups that you created as part of your project are available right now. So you have security group web, you have security group DB, and the default one which is created. If you don't pick and choose over here, by default you'll get the default security group. But right now, we are creating a new VM, and we are making it part of the security group uh, it's known as the web VM, so we are making it a part of the security group web. Similarly, on the network, we are also going to create, attach it to the web network, and then create, do launch. Since this is a very small instance, I'm actually going to delete the other VM so that we can uh, have, we can create multiple different uh, VMs over here, so. So we have a single web VM which is part of the web uh, network and it ha it's connected to the web security group. Let's go on and create another uh, VM which we, call, we can call DB and then attach it to the DB network and bring it on with the security policy as the security group of security group DB that we just created. Security group DB, details is DB. And on the networking tab, you can add the DB network over here. So let's go on the network topology and see that if we have the two VMs up. So one VM is uh, connected to the web, the other one maybe is connected to the DB part. Uh, the instance, once you actually, if you go back to the instance details, you can see in each of the instance details that which uh, security group are they connected to. So over here you can see the security groups it is attached to is security group DB, and there are no rules currently defined. So when there are no rules uh, defined in your security groups, it is implicit deny for all the traffic that is going out. So right now, you should not be able to uh, connect to anything outside. It should be completely isolated. So let's go back and check the other instance quickly as well. So we have web VM. It's connected to security group web. So we can actually then log in into each of the VM and see that whether we have connectivity or not. So let's log into the DB VM. just to confirm if we have the correct IP addresses over here. So this is the DB network. 
and let's try sending a ping uh, packet to sending an ICMP to uh, 50.4, which is which is our web VM. So let's do 192.168.50.4, and we should not be seeing any traffic. So you see, earlier we we I mean, if you check the network topology. You have a router which is connected to both instances. You were earlier able to connect to both of them because you had security policy allowing you to ha can have connectivity between the two security, between the two VMs. Right now, you are connected to a security group which has no rules as part of its uh, security group policy. So it's implicit deny for all the traffic that is coming out of the VM. So you cannot connect to the other VM. There is no traffic connectivity. Let's go to the instances, like let's go to the web instance as well and then just sign a ping packet from there as well just to see that if we have no connectivity from that end as well. So log in. So it's the same VM, 192.168.30.4. So you cannot have any packet over there as well. So let's do one thing, let's keep the ping uh, running on each of the VMs and then subsequently we can create the security group rules and see that how the traffic would be allowed in each case. So we have a DB VM which is trying to connect to the web VM and we have a web VM which is trying to connect to the DB VM and both are not connected right now. So let's go to the XSN security again. Uh, let's, let's start with security group web. Manage rules. Here, there are no rules specified right now because we deleted all the rules. So it's an implicit deny for all of them. If we add rules, we can add uh, different custom-based rules. But let's do, let's just allow ICMP packets to go uh, outside of this uh, VM. So let's do all ICMP. The traf the direction would be egress. And since we can actually have the remote as the default, the, the other security group where we want to actually connect, uh, send the traffic to. So when you have the remote as a security group, you get the options that which security group you want to create the security group rule for. So you, you can do security group DB. So this actually now is creating a rule, an ICMP rule, which is allowing all egress and ingress traffic for between the security group web and security group DB. So once you do an add, you should see that from the web VM, because it was the web security uh, group that we created, uh, the security group web, we actually added the rule in it. You should see that in the web VM, you should, the traffic starts flowing. So we have, an, we have, an allow, we have allowed the ICMP packets to actually go through and come back uh, only from the web security group. So if the traffic is initiated from the web VM, that is allowed right now. Let's go and check what's going on on the uh, other end. So, okay, so we have one VM over here, and we can, so, and similarly on the, on the other security group, we can add the security group rule over there as well, just to allow the ICMP traffic uh, from DB as well. So we have all ICMP, we have egress. In this case, we are in the DB, uh, we are currently in the DB uh, security group, so we will, the remote security group would be security group web, and do an add over here. That would, that would actually allow you to have complete uh, flow across the two uh, security groups. So traffic initiated from either of them should be allowed in this case. So let's stop this and just test it once again. It works from the web VM right now. So this is the, this is the web VM that we created with the web security group. And let's try it again with the uh, DB VM and ping it to the web the traffic initiated should work because we have a security group rule that allows the ICMP packets to go through. So let's do, uh, let's try the next step where we want to accomplish that we have the SSH from DB. We should have the SSH uh, traffic, like the DB should be allowed, the web VM should be allowed to SSH into the DB, but 
the DBVM should not be allowed to SSH back into the uh, web VMs. So let's quickly go. Yeah, just two minutes. Yeah. So, do you want to go through the? Yeah, I think we're running out of time. So yeah. uh, I wanted to wrap up and make sure that everyone uh, has all the information uh, next. So. Uh, we're going to leave these environments running for another hour or two, but there were a lot of environments, so we cannot keep them running forever. Um, there is a couple of follow-ups. Uh, so if you want to learn more, I know there were a lot of questions about PlumGrid and the technology underneath. We are in the expo floor. Uh, our booth is C21, so you can come see us. We're going to be hanging around here as well. Uh, if you want to keep testing and you want us to just keep your environment running for a little longer than an hour or two, just see us again outside and we can keep it running longer. We can give you up to three days, which you could just cannot do it for all of us, all of you guys. Uh, we hope this session was helpful. Uh, we apologize for the bumpy start, but we wanted to get as many people in. So uh, thanks a lot for sticking through the bumpy start and hopefully it was good for you. Um, and we got to wrap up because we are right at two. Well, first, thank you.